Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this public meeting of No to NATO, No to War. I'm Patrick Henningsen. I'll be co-hosting, filling in for uh, George Galloway, who's currently on the campaign trail. We'll uh, hear more about that later at the end of the program. But uh, we're going to be having a discussion about what's happening in the world right now. We're at a unique point in history. Uh, and we're going to be discussing this uh, impasse, if you will, uh, with three fantastic journalists who are going to be joining us, Rachel Blevins, Katie Halper, and David Clues. We're going to have a broad discussion about, well, a multi-front war that's now happening around the world. What are the risks and also the political ramifications? And more importantly, what can people do uh, wherever they are at home uh, to change the course of what is most likely going to become maybe an unfortunate outcome if it continues at its current trajectory. We're here to discuss this and the issues that face the world. For the last two years, the conflict in Ukraine has absolutely dominated the anti-war discussion internationally. It's reignited calls also to revisit the purpose and utility of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, known as NATO. In its current ever-expanding form, it does pose a threat to global peace and stability. I think this is beyond debate at this point. Uh, however, just as the conflict had begun to settle uh, into something approaching a stalemate, another major conflict front has opened up in the Middle East on October 7th, 2023, the unthinkable happened. The Palestinian resistance groups broke out of what is arguably the world's largest concentration camp known as the Gaza Strip and mounted a surprise attack on Israeli occupation forces and compounds. What has unfolded after that has no doubt begun to reshape not only the Middle East, but the entire global political landscape. Effectively, it threatens to upend Zbigniew Brzezinski's grand chessboard and the geopolitical world order. More importantly, though, and most importantly for the people in Gaza, the world has been forced to watch in abject horror a genocide broadcast 24-7 via the mainstream media, our laptops, our smartphones. They said never again, but never before has the world witnessed such a human catastrophe in real time. And thanks to Western governments backing and underwriting this black mark in history, people have felt absolutely helpless to do anything about it. We've been waiting over three months for something to happen, some ceasefire negotiations to begin, and all in vain. We've just been sat on the sidelines, hoping, pleading to our leaders that something can be done. And as we speak right now during this live broadcast, it seems there have been somewhat of a breakthrough uh, in Qatar regarding the ceasefire negotiations between the Israeli and Hamas delegations. But even as they go back and forth, arguing terms, innocent lives continue to be lost. As it goes, multiple NATO member states are directly involved in supporting Israel in its ongoing genocide of the native Palestinian population. The United States Germany, surprisingly, the second biggest deliverer of aid to Israel and the United Kingdom and France are just a few of the countries, NATO members, that are playing a high profile role as co-belligerents in this crime against humanity. And it's not my opinion. It's worse. It's a genocide. This is what the International Courts of Justice is now saying this is what the global community and the global consensus is on this issue, much to the dismay of politicians in Washington and London, in Paris, in Berlin and Brussels, that keep turning a blind eye to what everybody else is seeing and has been forced to see for the last three and a half months. It is a regrettable point in history, but now that we're faced with it, and now that we have a chance to actually uh, prevent it from happening again, if that's even possible. The world has an opportunity now to relook and revisit at the situation, our global security architecture, uh, where we are in terms of our governments in the West, whether you're in the United States or a NATO member state, what your foreign policy is. Is it serving the interests of your country, wherever you are, or is this something else? And does it need to be absolutely overhauled now in the 21st century? This is a rare opportunity. Will we take the opportunity and do something with it? Or will this opportunity, like previous times in history, slip through our hands collectively uh, on the global stage? Listen, we're going to hear from these various journalists that we have assembled today with this excellent panel. We're going to go one by one. Uh, we're going to speak to each of them, and then we'll do follow-up questions afterwards uh, to touch on some of the other points. 
that maybe we've missed during the exchange. But uh, firstly, I want to welcome all of our panelists and I want to introduce uh, an American journalist, independent journalist, Rachel Blevins, uh, who has uh, great work she's done with a number of outlets and most recently with RT International uh, as, a, as a journalist and a presenter. Rachel, welcome to No to NATO, No to War. Thank you so much for having me. No, it's our pleasure. Now, uh, Rachel, as, a, as an American journalist, obviously, um, you have a, a special interest in this, this story, both of these stories. Uh, and just wider from a geopolitical point of view, you've been lucky enough to be in different parts of the world and look at the world and look at these conflicts and how they play out uh, globally uh, from a different uh, pair of eyes, a different lens. As it stands right now, looking at the current I would say most dangerous time uh, in recent history. We're, we're much closer to that doomsday clock, I think, than at any point that I could ever remember. It's, certainly that's what people feel. Um, give us your thoughts on the current situation globally. Uh, and then also your thoughts, uh, you probably have an opinion on uh, NATO as an organization and how they're able to fly unofficially uh, in other conflicts, not under NATO, but the member states are still very much active and causing mayhem uh, right now in the Middle East. Rachel, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, when it comes to where we stand right now globally, I mean, there is a lot of hope, right? Because we are in a time when more and more people are actually talking about the Palestinian people and the Palestinian cause than we've seen arguably in decades. You know, if you look back at 2014, when you had Israel bombing the Gaza Strip, you had Palestinian civilians dying. There were some people that were waking up to that, but it wasn't nearly like it is today. Of course, the scale of the casualties wasn't anywhere like it is today. But I think that there is definitely some hope when you see a genocide case being brought to the International Court of Justice, even if the progress on that is very slow and frustrating to watch. It is still something. There are still people who feel like they can actually speak out and call out Israel. And for far too long, we've lived in kind of this echo chamber, specifically speaking about here in the United States, where many Americans felt like they couldn't criticize Israel or else they would be pointed at and people would say, oh, well, you're anti-Semitic. And, and now we're finally getting to a point where we can kind of separate Israel as an entity from where anti-Semitism stands from the Jewish people. They are not all one and the same. And you're seeing the results of that when you look at the Biden administration and you look at kind of their struggles to make it look like they are still in control, right? They send Secretary of State Antony Blinken over to the Middle East every few weeks. He goes to Tel Aviv. He tells Netanyahu, look, we really need you to stop killing so many Palestinian civilians. Netanyahu looks at him and says, no, we're good. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. And then they go kill several thousand and more. And the Biden administration is in a place right now where they, the truth of what they are doing and what they are supporting is being revealed to the world like never before. I mean, even in the case when you look at NATO support for the proxy war in Ukraine against Russia, there was so much propaganda surrounding that, especially in the early months. There was so much anti-Russian sentiment that it really took us a while. And we're still in this place of getting to the point now where people are able to wake up and see the truth of of what is happening in Ukraine. And it still is an ongoing battle. But in Gaza, in Palestine, when you're able to see the horrific images and videos shared all across the internet of what Israel is doing to the Palestinian people, the ways in which they are destroying families, destroying entire bloodlines, when people can see that online, they look at that and they say, wait a second, one, why is this happening? Two, how is it possible for this to happen? And when they ask that question, then they go back to, oh, wait a second, it's possible because Israel has the United States support militarily, publicly, politically, in every way they possibly can. And then they start asking the question of what they are able to do on their end. And that's why we're now seeing so much pushback against Biden, why you have you know Arab American and Muslim leaders in Michigan refusing to meet with him or his team saying, no, we're 
we're not going to meet with you and talk to you when you refuse to support a ceasefire in Gaza. And when it comes to the NATO alliance as a whole, they too are being exposed in a way. And that ultimately comes back to Ukraine, right? They supported this proxy war. They made it sound as if Ukraine was going to, I guess, accomplish something, right? Take back some of the territory it has lost since that NATO supported government overthrow back in 2014. And now because none of that has happened, because this massive record sanctions campaign against Russia has not been successful, it has failed spectacularly, and it has put Russia in a situation where it is reducing its reliance on the West in record time. Well, now that puts it all out in the open. And so I think the hope is that people start waking up to it again. We still have a long ways to go, but it feels as though we are making more progress right now than we have in a very long time. It, it feels like, uh, Rachel, that um, U Ukraine uh, coming into the fall of this past year was just becoming an embarrassment. It was like a ball and chain uh, for the West. They, they, they're attached to this you know, undefendable project, nation building project. And then October 7th came and it seemed to me, I don't know if you agree, but everyone was just lunging into that issue to support Israel. It seemed like the perfect distraction at the time uh, in order to kind of bury this embarrassment of the Ukraine project as a proxy war. But I think what has unfolded has uh, shocked and surprised everybody. And again, it's put the same people, the same bad actors on the back heels. Your thought about the optics of this uh, from a Western perspective? Yeah, and I think when it comes down to where the U.S. stands, right, there's are members of the establishment who just assume that when something is put out in the media, people will believe it, right? We go back to Russiagate. They say, oh, well, the American people were told over and over again that Russia was interfering in our election, and many of them believed it, and they didn't need proof to believe it. They just needed a mainstream media that told them over and over again and kind of ingrained that narrative into their mind. But in this situation with Ukraine, it goes over and over again, right? The mainstream media takes that narrative. I think the difference with October 7th was that we had so much of the evidence put out on social media. It didn't matter what CNN or what Fox News had to say about it. What mattered was what was being said mainly on Twitter. That was a big platform where people were able to go to it and to say, wait a second, why is this happening? And you're right, in the aftermath of October 7th, in those few days, the messaging was to say, oh, we should feel so sorry for Israel. They were attacked. But because the media refuses to have any sort of context there, because they refuse to have a conversation, they act as if it all began and ended on October 7th, then it leaves a place for other independent journalists and alternative media outlets to be able to talk about the context, to be able to talk about how the Palestinian people have been oppressed for decades now, how they have been targeted, how their land has been stolen from them, and how Israel has done all of this with support from the United States. And when that comes back to the Americans, who they're already in a situation where they're struggling to pay their bills, they're just trying to get by with their daily life, they're having to pay so much money in taxes, and then they're going, wait a second, this money that I'm paying in taxes isn't going to fix you know, my roads or to help my schools or anything like that. It is mainly going to fund this foreign aid that is going overseas. And not only is it going to Ukraine, now it's continuing to go to Israel as it has for many years now. They start to realize, wait a second, I am tied directly to those killings that I am seeing in Gaza, to this, the videos and the images of the horrific killings of Palestinian children. That was made possible by my government, who I am being forced to support. And it's it takes a minute to be able to draw all of those lines and to kind of realize that everything is connected. But for many people, that was kind of the waking up point. That's right, Rachel. A lot of people have woken up in ways that a lot of us who've been uh, following the uh, the conflicts over the years, anti-war activists, couldn't possibly have imagined the, the mass mobilization on the street for this issue is really unprecedented. Uh, it's historic, and uh, well, we hope at least to something positive down the road. We'll come back and speak to you uh, shortly, Rachel, but thank you very much uh, for your commentary there. I want to also welcome onto the stage right now another journalist, Katie Halper, uh, who is also American. Katie, thank you for joining us at No to NATO, No to War. Uh, hope you're well. And uh, 
Firstly, uh, Katie, I wanted to get your just general impressions about uh, the sort of various theaters that we're looking at that we're concerned about in the world, uh, about how this is affecting America politically, because I know that's where you're based. But uh, your, your general overview of the situation right now, Katie. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot going on. Um, and I thought maybe I could share just this particular political moment in America where we are right now. Uh, because basically, uh, Biden wants over $100 billion for war uh, in support of like a census war uh, in, in Russia and Ukraine. He wants to support genocide in Palestine and uh, war games in Taiwan. But unfortunately for Biden, the Republicans who do love war and they're very bloodthirsty, but uh, as much as they love war, they also really uh, enjoy making the lives of people who were born in the wrong place, i.e. immigrants, miserable. So uh, they are very intent on uh, vilifying, demonizing, and punishing people who are fleeing countries, which in many cases the United States destabilized or destroyed. So we have this bizarre gridlock of Republicans underfunding imperialism unless Biden agrees to get tough on the border. And luckily for Republicans, but unluckily for the world at large, Biden is all too ready to oblige uh, being tougher. He's even touted that his border offer is the toughest deal ever, but Republicans still aren't satisfied. And uh, the delay in funding the war in Ukraine, uh, of course, a war that was totally avoidable and a war that the United States made inevitable by, uh, by provoking uh, Putin and also by getting in the way, by scuttling negotiations when uh, Putin and Zelensky were actually going to negotiate, um, this delay in funding isn't just upsetting to Biden and the Pentagon, but it's really tragic news to NATO. And I want to actually read something that um, the uh, Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg of NATO said on Sunday during a Fox News appearance, because, uh, of course, he's urging Congress to pass this murderous package to support uh, war. So he said, what matters is that Ukraine gets continued support because we need to realize that this is closely watched in Beijing. It's not only making Europe more vulnerable, but making the United States more vulnerable if Putin gets what he wants in Ukraine. This is a good deal because by using a fraction of the defense budget, we have been able to destroy and degrade the Russian army substantially. And therefore, we should continue to do so because most of this money is actually spent in the United States. When we buy U.S. weapons to support Ukraine, this secures jobs in America and makes us all safer. So it's basically a mountain of bodies under a pile of money. And note that he doesn't pr mention protecting Ukrainians or saving the lives of Ukrainians, because that's not what this is about. This is about destroying Russia and using Ukrainians as cannon fodder uh, in this new Cold War. Uh, note that it's not just a proxy war between Russia and the United States, which we know is the fact because people have said this time after time, time and time again, but it's also a proxy war between NATO and the U.S. And uh, as we see from what he said about China, it's also a proxy. This this proxy war is merely a proxy war for another proxy war, which is with another enemy, China. And this isn't just about uh, Lockheed Martin profits for the next quarter, uh, which obviously Stoltenberg is reminding us that we are that they're buying uh, U.S. weapons. But it's also about U.S. imperialism and Western hegemony. And uh, it is telling that while Biden is pushing for hundreds of billions of dollars in bullets and bombs, there's a new report out that says that half of Americans cannot afford uh, rent. And now, uh, as if it's not enough that all these NATO countries are legitimizing and funding genocide in Gaza, we have this incredibly disturbing story about how several NATO member countries are defunding UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, because the pathological liar that is Israel is claiming, of course, without any evidence, not that that's stopping the Western media from happily regurgitating these claims, they're claiming that a handful of UNRWA employees participated in some way on October 7th. And instead of investigating first and then firing, the donor countries have fired first, 
then defunded second and now are allegedly investigating and they're cutting off funding to an already um to an organization that provides desperately needed aid to the people of Palestine who are already suffering beyond belief. And I actually did the math because uh, if they, they said that there were, first they said there were 12 employees of UNRWA. Now they're saying that there were six. And that represents 0.0002% of UNRWA employees. So 0.0002% of the IDF would be 33.8 soldiers. So to be, we'll round up to 34 soldiers. So, Obviously, by definition, every single member of the IDF has committed war crimes, given how Israel occupies, bombs, starves, and collectively punishes, takes out with snipers, denies food, etc. But even Israel's biggest supporters would admit that we could find 34 Israeli soldiers who've committed crimes. So it's I think that we should uh, not be hypocrites and we should defund the IDF. It's only fair and it's uh, only consistent. So that's my call. Yeah, I think that's a pretty straightforward solution. The, th the extraordinary thing about what you just said, Katie, is they're start they're starting to say the quiet part out loud, uh, which is that this is about American jobs. All this war is good. We we're hearing this from multiple U.S. officials. It's almost like this talking point is being passed around now. Is safe to say, uh, you know, this is about jobs at home and and good good profits and good for the economy. Uh, they they never used to say that. That was just always implied. But the fact that they're kind of saying that. Uh, now is is something else, but I want to get your opinion on this. Um, as somebody in the United States, you've been probably political a large part of your adult life, I assume, especially if you're yeah. working in this space. Exactly. What happened? We know about the neocons, Katie. We know about their uh, proclivities towards war and destruction, um, but the Democrats are always there to just slightly check them in extreme situations. And I know this is not an overnight process, but now there is absolutely no difference. And in some cases, some of the Democrats are even more hawkish uh, with, with these wars supporting Ukraine or, or Israel than even some of the Republicans. What? How did this happen? And is, is this something at the leadership level, but not at the kind of community level? What What, what is your sort of you know, idea as to how this phenomenon's taken place. Well, yeah, I mean, we are now being asked to choose uh, between the fascism of Trump and the imperialism of Biden, and we're really like staring down the phrase "the lesser of two evils" and asking what that what that means. Um, I think what happened was a couple of things. I think Obama really um, kind of paralyzed the anti-war movement. I think people were kind of asleep at the wheel. They thought that a more progressive president was in. And I also think that a big part of this is Russiagate. And this is something that I talk about a lot on my show, The Katie Helper Show, but also that we talk about a lot on Useful Idiots, which is a show that I co-host with Aaron Mate. And Russiagate really did pave the way for the war uh, in Ukraine because it broke people's brains. It made people think that Russians were these kind of almost not human. I mean, people talked about like the Russian, they're always talking about the Russian playbook, but the people even talk about a, a virus, a Russian virus, the vilification of Putin, the uh, Hitlerification of Putin, which is extremely offensive and dangerous and ahistorical, but to suggest that Putin is not only as bad as Hitler, but you have actually people going on MSNBC saying that he's worse than Hitler, making the very anti-Semitic claim that at least uh, Hitler didn't kill uh, his own. Uh, at least he didn't kill German speakers, which, I mean, I don't know if people realize Michael McFall is the person who said that on Rachel Maddow's show. I don't know if he realizes how anti-Semitic that is and how stupid that is. But you do have people believing it's really a neo-McCarthyism. and. People think that Putin is totally irrational. And you don't have to like Putin. You just have to not want Ukrainians to die. That's what's so ironic about this. This isn't about liking Putin or disliking Putin. This is just about not wanting war. And if you think that the U.S. Wa wants peace, you're in denial or you're ignorant. But also, all you have to do is look at how we sent our errand boy, Boris Johnson, to scuttle negotiations between Zelensky and uh Putin. And look at how we've said time and time again, we're going to fight to every last Ukrainian. This is such a great deal. No Americans are dying. We don't need boots on the ground. Basically admitting that uh, Ukrainians are fighting this war 
for us, you have Adam Schiff, Congressman Adam Schiff, saying we're fighting Russia over there so we don't have to fight them over here. I mean, it's just, they're, as you said, they're saying the quiet parts out loud. They're doing and the same with, with Hamas, uh, Katie. They're saying, you know, we, we're supporting Israel so that Hamas doesn't come over our southern border. As if, oh, right. it's exactly. as if Hamas yeah. is, you know, hanging out, eating uh, tacos uh, in Mexico City, waiting to make the, the rush north. I mean, it's ridiculous. That's what I was thinking, actually, before. I forgot to mention this. But you have the exact parallel. You have the Hitlerification of Putin. And at the same time, you have the ISISization of Hamas which again is a very ahistorical, ignorant thing to say. Hamas is not an international tech theorist uh, organization. They, the Christians live in Gaza. Uh, you don't have to worry if you're a Westerner. Now you do have to worry if you're a Westerner in Gaza because you'll get bombed. But this idea that when you know areas uh, where Hamas is in power are like areas where ISIS is in power is just so insensitive to the brutality of ISIS, the way that they uh, go out at, you know, purposely kill every civilian just by virtue of their religion. Now, there's a lot of fog of war, and there were civilians killed on October 7th, but the, uh, that's not part of Hamas's um, mission in, in, in their governing, right? This was one day where, they, where there was an uprising and there was violence, and I think a lot of it we're learning more and more probably was committed by people who weren't necessarily part of Hamas. They were just people who went through the, the fence, but even if Hamas did, and I don't, this is maybe controversial for some of my supporters. I, I don't, I don't think that the violence was, um, how do I say this? It's horrific what happened on October 7th. But as Gideon Levy, an Israeli journalist said, you can't imprison 2 million people and not pay a price. I mean, if people who think this history started October 7th really don't know their history or they're lying and they know their history, but they don't see Palestinians as human beings. But this, uh, this vilification of all Palestinians. And the other thing is, let's say you think, because you're ignorant that Hamas is ISIS. Let's just say you think that, right? And again, I want to be clear, it's not at all like ISIS. But what's the justification for not sending medicine in for children? What's the justification for not sending in anesthesia? So you have kids and adults getting amputations. Can you imagine being amputated, having body parts amputated without anesthesia? What's the justification for starving and no water? And you have these people in, uh, at the border, these Israelis protesting, letting aid through. I mean, it's a sadism and it's a psychosis. And I come from a Jewish family. I have relatives in Israel. Never again does not mean only never again to Jews. And in fact, in the name of our defense, we're going to genocide other people. This doesn't make Jews safe. Israel doesn't make me safe. Israel doesn't make Jews safe. Israel puts Jews at risk. They're broadcasting their crimes against humanity and claiming to act in the name of Jews, and they're not. And we're seeing this more and more. More and more Jews are speaking out and saying that. But this is not at all making Jews safer, and I wish people would realize this. I mean, luckily, you have organizations like If Not Now and Jewish Voice for Peace who are doing great work. But the uh, idea that I, as a Jew, am okay with Palestinian children who had nothing to do with the Holocaust. And then you have Germany daring to defend Israel. Germany needs to deal with its own complicity. They have to deal with their role in creating this. They're the ones who are responsible for this. Palestinians had nothing to do with the Holocaust. And the idea that these people have to pay the price of Germany's crimes is just awful. And then that Germany has the gall to interfere at all when they're the ones who should be um, atoning, not just to Jews, but now to Palestinians, because they've totally um, sold out the Palestinians. So that, that implies that they ever had their back. So let's not say that, but they've totally vilified Palestinians, demonized them, othered them, and made them pay their crimes, pay for their crimes. Once again, throughout history, uh, Europe imposing its problems on other parts of the world. Uh, we're just in a sort of cause and effect uh, cycle there that unfortunately this is the latest and most regrettable episode of it. Katie Halper, thank you for your comment on that. I want to go over right now, though, to our other guest on the panel, David Clues from the Unity News Network. David, how, how are you doing today? Excellent, Patrick. Thanks. Yourself? Not too bad, uh, David. Now, look, uh, one of the key actors in this, of course, uh, is the UK government, because uh, as we know, there is no coalition of the willing for anything unless the United, unless the United Kingdom is shoulder to shoulder with, with the United States. Uh, and some extraordinary things have taken place politically since October 7th. But even with the Ukraine war, I see a, a pattern developing here, David, whereby uh, it seems like 
Britain uh, is intervening to stop peace negotiations, to uh, stop any sort of uh, armistice or anything like that, literally will physically intervene uh, and then go after other NATO member states if they're not doing enough. Um, they seem to be doing the work of the U.S. that the U.S. can't quite do politically on its own, but it needs Britain. This is an extraordinary special relationship, David. <laughs> what are your thoughts on this? It, it, it's very interesting because there's this sort of toxic mix, I think, at the heart of the the British establishment because you still have like this Tory vanguard, you know, the, the Etonian upper class who still think Britain is this global player. They hark back to the days of, of, of empire. Um, thanks, Susan. They hark back to the days of empire when obviously that isn't the case. And then you have the, the, these, Modern Tories and modern Labour as well, they they still see us as having this special role to spread our values, you know, and these these values are are very specific to the the British government. But yes, yeah, it's, it's it's ridiculous. And it was interesting you talked about the coalition of the willing because at least George W. Bush actually tried to bring people together and create a coalition of the willing, whereas. October the 7th happened and and basically was, right, we're just going to bomb these people into oblivion. Here's all the weapons that you need. And um, nobody's allowed to question it. And if you do question it, we'll call you an anti-Semite. We'll call you a bigot. And we'll try and have you cancelled. And it, I mean, I don't mean to laugh. It's just, it's terrible. Um, and and I, I come from quite an interesting background. And in up until maybe a five or six years ago, I was part of that sort of normie conservative way of thinking you know i was never i was never a huge fan of the likes of jordan peterson or douglas murray but you know i could i could understand their point of view but obviously with everything that's happened in the last five years i know patrick you and i were very involved in in covid and what went on there then what happened with the ukraine war how can anybody have any support whatsoever for what the British government is doing and the, the American government as well. And it like uh, nothing the Israelis are doing in Gaza is acceptable. It, it's beyond any norm. Nobody who has any normality, like even if you're a mild supporter of Israel, I mean, I mean obviously they, they don't have a good track record, but this is something completely different. This is a massacre. It is a genocide. They are starving these people. They are humiliating them. It, it, as, as Katie pointed out, and as much as I don't like Owen Jones, uh, Owen Jones said that, that this is happening before everybody's eyes and we're, we're, we're almost helpless about it. it it's, I don't think there's a grey area here. You're either against people being innocently slaughtered, innocent people being slaughtered or or you support it. There seems to be a bipartisan consensus, um, of course, in Washington, but in the UK, no difference whatsoever no. between Labour and Conservative. It was only 10 years ago, imagine this, David, even when Ed Miliband came on the on the floor of the House of Commons and stood against the, the move to bomb Syria and sort of spearheaded the opposition vote on that and, and effectively defeated it by a very slim margin. And Cameron uh, put his head down and marched out uh, in in defeat on that. But that if that happened today, uh, David, I don't think there would have been any opposition. So things have changed radically. You know, yeah. Jeremy Corbyn's departure, Chris Williamson's departure, Ken Livingston's departure, kicked out of their parties. Unbelievable. So you have this uh, very bizarre situation where they've been talking about foreign meddling or you know foreign influence in 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 mm -hmm. Western politics, but it seems one country has effectively not just meddled but taken total control yeah. over the foreign <laughs> policy of Britain. Nobody's talking about that when they talk about foreign influence. David, what are well, your thoughts? A hundred percent. I mean, you you saw the meltdown people were having over Ilhan Omar and and our speech about Somalia, whereas. It's very tame <laughs> compared to what, you, you know, politicians in America who are owned by APAC or the ZOA. And, you know, I, I, I now look back. I mean, I, I was, again, I wasn't massively opposed to Jeremy Corbyn, but I was opposed to him. Whereas now I look back on it and you, you see what was done to Jeremy Corbyn, the lies that was told about him, the, the way he was, he was smeared. And that really is because he wasn't part of the Zionist 
machine. He, he, he was opposed to it and he was against it and they completely destroyed him. And Starmer has, has come in and he has just purged the Labour Party of 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 all dissent. And, you know, so it's gone from where, you, you know, just a few years ago, the whole audience hall was, was waving Palestinian flags to now they're in support. And it shows you really the class of politician that there is and the calibre of politician that they're so easily bought off. They have no morals. They have no decency. And I, I think they're ter they are terrified of the Israeli lobby. You look at what they've done to a series of politicians over the years. Um, Alan Duncan, Crispin Blunt, for example, in the Tory party, even Andrew Bridgen as well. I think uh, the, the, the Andrew Bridgen is not comfortable with what's going on. And they come after you with such viciousness that I think with the way politics is now, most of them just think, well, I'll either support them or I'll just say nothing because it's not worth it. No, you're absolutely correct. And that, that amazing uh, Crispin Blunt, British uh, MP, uh, literally was taken out in this kind of from left field with a, a sex scandal just after the legal, the first big legal move against yeah. Israel in the wake of uh, their bombing run on Gaza. I mean, that it wasn't a coincidence, I think. Um, it's worthy of more investigation. That'll probably come out in someone's memoirs <laughs> in a few years, David, when we eventually yeah. find out the answer to that. But, yeah, um, absolutely. and it's it's it is just across the board, and and the thing is, is obviously we don't want to get into sort of internal politics, but the left very much created the cancel culture, this this terror of saying the wrong thing, and it's it's consumed them now. You know that uh, whereas the people that the, because they know how powerful the anti-Semitism allegation or smear or whatever it is, they know how powerful it is. It it works. It. It is it, to be called that is is toxic. It will r ruin it, and of course, the vast majority of these people are not approaching this from what they would they they regard it as. They they use it and like look at what they've done to like Roger Waters. Just the 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 na and it's the naked lies. Yeah. You know that's the thing that really bugs me the most. I'm not an ideological purist, but you know Roger Waters dresses up as Roger Waters dresses up as Nazi, implying he's like a, a fascist sim. When this whole act is actually talking about how bad it is, it's it's actually very frightening. But what 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 they are relying on is a public who has never been more docile, who has never been as 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 glum to what goes on. All they do is read their social media feed, and that is one thing the Israelis know how to play: the forty beheaded baby stories, the mass rapes, the way they. It doesn't matter. Well, I mean, these were these were complete lies. But as long as they get out there and as long as they're on the headlines, then it it it, it works. Oh, just the propaganda discussion alone warrants a massive uh, panel discussion. Hopefully, we can revisit that in the future. David Clues, Unity News Network, really appreciate your commentary Thanks, there. I want to go back to Rachel Blevins uh, from the United States. Um, Rachel, you know, one of the most extraordinary things, uh, both with Ukraine and with this very tragic situation uh, in Gaza, is the fact that there is no, it, there's been no attempt at any diplomacy. Now, uh, we, 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 we know why this, how this could be uh, engineered on the, the Gaza situation by labeling Hamas a, quote, terrorist organization that precludes any uh, you know, communications or whatever, and it's just really emergency measures, scorched earth policy, anything to, quote, eliminate the problem. But with Ukraine, uh, again, no peace negotiations. It's like, let's keep the war going. This isn't the world that I grew up in, where we deployed career diplomats. Um, with your also knowledge of of, of the Russian uh, foreign service, there they have very skilled diplomats. They're career diplomats. Their job is to diffuse tension, to adhere to international law, to communicate uh, where their side is in relation to their counterpart. That's all out the window now. This is an extremely dangerous development, I think, from a Western point of view is this kind of complete uh, withdrawal from any uh, of what used to be known as diplomacy or any sort of negotiations. It's almost like, let's get the war on and then stop us if you if you think you can or until we get what we want. It, it's unbelievable. But your your feelings on, on this general trend, that's this unfortunate trend that we're seeing. 
Yeah, I think we saw it in early 2022, as Katie was mentioning there, you know, when you have attempts by Russia and even by Ukraine at the time to say, hey, let's have some sort of peace talks. They had meetings in Istanbul. And then all of a sudden you have Boris Johnson being sent over there for the surprise visit, as it was described in the media. And then all of a sudden those attempts at peace just completely fall apart. And ever since then, the U.S. hasn't wanted to talk about any kind of a ceasefire. You had reports in early 2022 that the State Department was telling Kiev no concessions, make no concessions, which, and if that's the case, then you're not going to have any kind of peace agreement. There's no point at even having any kind of talks. And yet when we fast forward to the situation in Gaza that we're currently looking at, and when you're mentioning there where Russia stands in all of this, we have to remember in the early weeks after October 7th, Russia got in there and they got their hostages out. That was a major thing. They were willing to say, okay, we're going to have talks. We are going to deal with Hamas. We know that we have Russian nationals here that were taken as hostages and they got the job done. That's something Israel hasn't done. That's something that the U.S. certainly hasn't done. And it's this focus on more and more war that we seem to have continuing here in Washington. And in 2023, the U.S. broke records for weapon sales. The United States government made about 50% more than they had the previous year when it came to their weapon sales. So of course, on their end, all of the individuals in Washington who profit off of war, they're doing just fine right now. But what we're not doing as a country is continuing to focus on ourselves here at home, focusing on our infrastructure, focusing on what can be done for the American people. And because we're just exporting weapons and ammunition to so many different conflicts in the world and continuing on in that way, what we're doing as a country is we're falling behind because the other countries who are willing to actually negotiate and have talks, they are the ones who are going to the forefront. I know we had former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi who had that infamous CNN interview last weekend in which she said that if you were calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, you are spreading Mr. Putin's message. Now, that's actually a compliment in a way because Putin and other leaders from Russia, China, and a number of other countries, they've been calling for a ceasefire since day one in Gaza. They've been at the forefront saying, hey, we need to talk about some kind of a solution. We need to stop this endless bombardment coming from Israel. And so if Pelosi just wants to package that as a bad thing, saying you can't call for peace, if you do, you're just echoing Russia. Well, then for the average person, that may make them think, well, what does Russia have to say about this? Because maybe I agree agree with them more than I agree with all of the hawks in Washington, like Lindsey Graham, who have called for war with Iran so many times, and yet he's not exactly ready to go to the front lines himself. I like the way you put a positive spin on that comment by uh, Nancy. I didn't think of it that way, uh, Rachel, that she's actually echoing Putin's message. Does that mean that Nancy Pelosi is probably a crypto Russian agent herself, maybe? <laughs> keep, keep that one going. <laughs> so, right. Um you know, it's incredible. Um, yeah, I, I, I've got uh, separate um, opinions on um, some of our uh, congressmen and senators. Some of them should have been put out to pasture a long time ago. Uh, but the, the amount of money, I think you alluded to an important point, uh, Rachel, that America has gotten rid of offshore, dismantled a lot of its manufacturing over the years. But there's one industry that stays at home, and that is the military industrial complex. And there's a lot of money sloshing around the beltway in the last couple of years. It is really unbelievable. Uh, the fortunes uh, that are flying around in Washington, D.C., between the lobbyists, the consultancy firms, it is, it's is—it's—it's a totally different city than it was 20 years ago. Uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with exactly uh, what you're talking about, Rachel. And that's I think, I think that's what's driving a lot of this. I think this is arguably what's driving a lot of foreign policy right now uh in in the world really shocking uh on different levels your final thoughts though rachel um before we move on but go ahead yeah, I think everyone right now is keeping an eye on the U.S. and its response to this latest drone attack that killed three American troops on the border between uh, basically in Jordan on the border with Syria. And as we watch that, we watch the messaging that is coming from the Biden administration, which is the admission that, look, Iran was not involved directly in this drone attack. They can't really prove that. And they've sort of sort of admitted that. 
But what they are continuing to do is they are continuing to use this message saying oh, it was Iran backed militias, right? Iran backed Houthis in Yemen are targeting Israel linked ships in the Red Sea. And when you watch their messaging, then you also watch who they want the bad guys of the moment to be, whether that's Russia, China, Iran, just pick a country on any given day. I know now the FBI is also warning about alleged election interference from China. So it's as if they kind of spin the bottle and literally just pick one of those three. But the messaging becomes so incredibly tiring. And my hope is that people will continue looking to alternative sources, looking to independent journalists and media and asking the question of what is beyond just what the administration is saying. And of course, what the mainstream media, especially here in the United States, is continuing to parrot over and over again as they too sell us more and more war. Rachel Blevins, uh, independent journalist based in the United States. You want to be following Rachel on X, uh, Twitter, also her Instagram feed uh, and other platforms. Rachel, I've seen your hot takes uh, over the last couple of years. So very informative and you do a great job in boiling things down in a concise way. And I think you've made a big impact uh, with your work as well. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Rachel. I want to bring Katie Halper, uh, American journalist and host of the Katie Halper Show, back onto the program. Katie, 2024 election cycle is in motion. Uh, and we've had some surprises on the Democratic side. There used to be absolute unity on pretty much everything. And th especially this uh, situation, the crisis in Gaza. This has done something to that sort of once impregnable coalition uh, with progressives, the Democratic Party. Biden seemed to have marshaled that successfully in the last election. But now we see fissures. We see cracks over this issue. Explain to us what's happening here. Will that will this issue can this issue affect the outcome of the 2024 election for Democrats across the board? Uh, even down ballot positions. What what are your feelings on this? How the impact of 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 what we're seeing and what people are feeling out there? Well, I think that uh, it will have an effect because, as Nancy Pelosi was asked about this the other day, God, it's so embarrassing. But Dana Bash asked Nancy Pelosi on CNN if she thought that Biden's position on Israel was going to harm him in the election in 2024, not that people would vote for Trump, but that they would just stay home and not get out and vote. And Pelosi said no, but she also, because of course she's either lying or in denial, she's not gonna admit it, but also showing how out of touch she is, she also said that a lot of people who were saying uh, uh, ceasefire, as Rachel just referred to, were, um, were, uh, regurgitating Putin's talking point. She said ceasefire is Putin's talking point. You have um, a staffer for Kamala Harris at an event to get out the vote, uh, not letting in two young women because they were wearing hijab, they were wearing head coverings, and he singled them out as people who should not be able to get into this event. Uh, you have the uh, White House spokeswoman, Karine Jean-Pierre, being asked uh, what Biden's message is to Arab Americans as he visits Michigan. And her response was, I'm not kidding. Israel has the right to defend itself. I mean, you can't make this up. And Biden ran as someone who was not Trump. Biden ran as the alternative to Trump. Biden ran as someone who was not going to be bad to, you know, Muslims, no Muslim ban. He was not going to be bad to immigrants, no locking kids up putting kids in cages. He has put kids in cages. He's vowing to be tougher. And he doesn't have a Muslim ban, but he certainly is mistreating the Muslims of uh, Palestine and, and telling Muslim Americans to go to hell. And of course, we know that um, Palestinians are, they are Christian as well. Um, the truth is, though, that in the United States, and I think in much of the world, the non-Arab world, and the non-Muslim world, Arab and Muslim are conflated. They're obviously different. You can be Arab and Muslim. You can be Arab and Christian. You can be Muslim and Bosnian, or you can be Muslim and Palestinian. But I think he's telling that whole um, population, anyone who identifies with either of those things, that they are um, disposable or that he doesn't need to rely on them for a vote. And, you know, this is affecting young people and uh, people of color are seeing through this, I think, in ways that white people aren't. Um, I think it's a question of racism. 
I think it's relatable for some people in a way that it's not for white people. But again, uh, I believe two thirds of Biden's voters uh, think it's genocide what's happening in uh, in Palestine. And I also want to say that for people who are concerned with the lives and safety of Jews, if you care about Jews and you care about Israeli Jews, and those are the Jews you claim to care about, right? In this conflict, although other people, as we just discussed, are pretending this is some kind of international thing and uh, Hamas is like ISIS, just like they're pretending uh, Putin has an international vision to like invade other countries. Um, but, you know, even though Hamas has distinguished between Jews and Zionists and they've said their problem with Zionists is not that they're Jewish, their problem with Zionists is that they're Zionists. But if you care about the hostages and you want to bring them home, maybe you want to not bomb buildings where they could be held. Maybe you want to have a ceasefire. We all know that pro-Israel people, a lot of them couldn't care less about Palestinians. They think they're subhuman, but you're supposed to care about the Israeli Jews. Like that's your shtick, so to speak. So maybe you want to encourage a ceasefire just for that reason. Maybe you should be upset that, um, that they, put gas in a tunnel and killed an Israeli. Uh, maybe you should be upset that they shot three Israeli Jewish hostages who had um, white flags and were speaking to them in Hebrew. I mean, this is what, when you get to actually, when, when you care more about killing Palestinians and saving the lives of Jews, you know that you're deranged. Now I should, I don't want to say that, um, it's okay to care more about lives, Jewish lives and Palestinian lives. I think that's r racist and deranged. And of course, not to sound, you know, not to make this about myself or about being Jewish, but there is a tradition in Judaism and and in secular Jewish culture of tikkun olam, which means to repair the world. There's a long tradition of Jews concerned with social justice and concerned with um, internationalism and solidarity. And the Jews of uh, Israel, uh, the Jews of Likud do not represent my Jewishness at all. I want to make that clear. And also, the, you know, you, you talked about the African-American uh, community and, and voters in America, a very influential segment of the African-American community are Muslims and Muslim converts. Yeah. Uh, they're also big influencers, actors, comedians, uh, very successful athletes. Some of the biggest role models uh, in, that, in that community are, in fact, Muslims. And they often that point gets overlooked. Yeah. Um, when the media is do, doing the analysis on this. So um, there is a lot more support there, I think, for the Palestinian cause than a lot of people realize. And it's a deep, there's a deep, deeply seated support as well. Um, so that might reflect in the, uh, the results of the election coming up. Uh, we'll see. And another and, thing I would say is that, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, go ahead. Another thing I would say is that all these people who are trying to vote shame and say, oh, how could you not vote? How could you not already vow to vote for Biden? And now in in uh, January, how could you not in February not already be guaranteeing Biden your unconditional support? You must not care about fascism or you must not care about marginalized people because Trump is worse. You know what? If you really care about preventing Trump from getting into office, if you actually care about that, then you'd be pressuring Biden, one person with a lot of power to call for a ceasefire to stop being complicit in genocide. You can't control a bunch of people and amorphous countless number of people who are saying they're not gonna vote for this guy, but you can force one person to do the right thing. And you certainly would be trying to do that if you cared about preventing Trump from getting into office. Well, I think, uh, unfortunately, Joe Biden's missed that opportunity uh, by this point. Uh, the damage, sadly, has has been done. But, uh, yeah, excellent insights there uh, from Katie Halper. Thank you, Katie, uh, for your insights there, especially because the election, the U.S. election is something the whole world uh, tends to dive into and become interested in. And uh, when the results come, people will be doing the postmortem, whoever wins or loses. Certainly, I think I agree with Katie. Uh, this is going to play into uh, the 2024 election in a way that a lot of people don't realize a deep deeper level i think it speaks to moral issues and it speaks to values that uh, many people hold dear and hold in common but uh, it doesn't seem our leadership and certain members of the elite class uh, seem to have jettisoned some of these values and ideals uh in recent years if they had them at all that's arguable uh david clues from unity 
News Network. Um, David, uh, this this brings us to a, to an important point, and um, I I think you're probably one of the last interventions in this discussion. But um, we we hear a lot about Western values. Uh, the values that underpin the rules-based international order, our democratic values, uh, all of these things that uh, we we have somehow, you know, in the West or at least in the G7 countries, um, we we uphold these things globally, and we will, if necessary, enforce them. Uh, if if other parts of the world can't uh, can't seem to be in line with our quote values, um, now this situation I think has absolutely destroyed that rhetoric in a way that I don't know if it can ever recover, David, but even if I say this, and as we talk about this, David, they're still trying it. We still see it in the, in the sanctimonious yep. speeches and so forth. Your comments on, on this moral gap now that's yeah. uh, becoming more pronounced. It's, 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 it's crazy. And I actually just noticed, um, while, while, while I was I was scaring something there, Jens Stoltenberg has been nominated for the for the Nobel <laughs> Peace Prize by the uh, Norwegians. Uh, yeah, it's the hypocrisy is completely off the charts. What, they often talk about the rule, rules based order. What, can can I see a copy of that, please? They have they have no moral standing at all. It, 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 it's gone, and I now see this when you listen to the Iranians, when you listen to the Russians, when you listen to the Chinese, when you listen to the North Koreans, the people that are supposedly part of the axis of evil, they actually all come across as very balanced, very measured. Obviously, they have their own geopolitical interests, but they they don't have the hysteria, whereas when you listen to the neocon warmongers, whether they're here or they're in the United States of America, there's no balance. There's no talk of of compromise. There is no real politic, as you 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 pointed out earlier when you were talking about the statesmanship. There's no statecraft. Nothing. It is just literally. Let's send some more money. Let's send some more weapons, and we'll just keep the bombs dropping. And it, it's it, it's a dreadful state of affairs because then after that you've just got these. Middle manager politicians, the likes of Rishi Sunak, Macron, the the there's no conviction there at all, and it's it's terrible. Although, and but it was interesting what you're talking about is people voting now. I used to be a big Trump fan as well, whereas I've been floating this out. I think if Trump was in charge right now, it I, I think it would be even worse. I actually think there is a big thing at play to get Trump back in the White House in November, and. He'll he will unleash the gates of hell. People say, "Well, Trump never started a war." Well, <laughs> if you want someone to start a war, that's a good excuse to get them in the door. And America's in a very difficult situation because I think Trump is. They would, and the, especially the Republican Party, they are, you, they are, you know, they have a messianic belief around the state of Israel. This very dangerous ideology of Christian Zionism. I don't think people fully realize how dangerous that is. You know, this, the Messiah is coming. I, I, it's, it's one of these ones where better the devil, you know, and, and Biden's going to definitely take a hit on this, especially amongst younger people. But it's not as if Trump's going to come in and he's going to be Mr. Nuanced and Mr. Peacemaker. I, I think... I think he would be far more gung ho, and the, the the his base, even though intrinsically they would be against that, they would follow his lead. Um, and it's it's gearing up to be a very dangerous year in, in my. I mean, I might be totally wrong about it. Trump might come in and actually bang the drums of peace. He might put an end to all this, but there might be something worse. Yes, uh, holding out hope that uh, Trump is going to be that philosopher king <laughs> that many <laughs> dream of and hope that he 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 would or should be. Uh, I, I'm not going to hold my breath for any any politician in the 21st century, not any of the ones that I've seen on the carousel at the moment. But yeah, a lot of people share your sentiments, uh, David. Very cautious, very trepidatious here in America. Very concerned because they're not hearing what they want to, which what what these people, including Donald Trump and other candidates should be saying uh which is calming it down 
applying yeah. the brakes. We're not seeing or hearing that. That's very, that's what's very concerning uh, to us. David Clues, Unity News Network, uh, follow on uh, X Twitter, also your website as well. Unity is, uh, give us your URL real quick before you go, David. It's unitynewsnetwork.co.uk. Best place is Twitter at Unity Newsnet. All our links are 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 there. So thank you, Patrick. A great panel tonight. Really, again, really sensible, calm, measured stuff. And I always think that when I listen to guys like yourselves and all of us, the media are deemed too dangerous to be allowed near a news studio. Um, <laughs> the, the, even though we may have political disagreements on things, I would like to think people could be adult enough to to discuss politics without having to go and then drop white phosphorus on children. You know, it is 2024 after all. That's right. That's not extremists dropping chemical weapons on civilian populations, but having conversations about uh, what's happening in Gaza is is somehow uh, akin to, uh, you know, hate speech or dangerous speech. You're right, David. We should all be on guard for people like us. Thank you very much Thanks, for joining us, David Clues. Uh, uh, before we wrap up, uh, I want to get a final thoughts uh, from Katie Halper. And bring Katie back up on stage. Um, give us your, your your final thoughts and anything that's uh, important that you think uh, wasn't touched on so far, Katie. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to talk about how incredibly biased the media is towards Israel. And that's something everyone has to remember. In fact, I just had on my show, on the Katie Halper Show, a journalist from The Intercept uh, talking about the fact that New York Times staffers freaked out about the New York Times allegedly bombshell report um, uh, about sexual violence on October 7th. And it was such shoddy journalism that one of the main alleged victims of rape, her family is refuting what the New York Times said. It was such shoddy journalism that the New York Times was going to release a podcast uh, based on this story. And there was an uproar among the staff uh, because they thought it was so bad and so unreliable. And what happens is time after time and time again, Israel is says something, the New, the New York Times, the uh, Guardian, the Washington Post, um, MSNBC, NBC, CBS, ABC, BBC, regurgitate it. And then we discover that Israel was lying, but the damage is done. It doesn't matter. Either people don't even correct it, don't even run updates, or if they do, it's okay because it already worked. The propaganda already worked. So people really need to ask for the evidence and know that the entire media apparatus is incredibly biased towards Israel against Palestinians. I mean, sometimes it's so obvious, like the BBC didn't stream South Africa's case against Israel mm -hmm. alleging genocide in front of the International Court of Justice. They didn't stream that, but they streamed Israel's defense against it. How on earth can you justify that? So I just want to encourage people to, and of course, feel free to check out my show. Uh, I talked about that uh, and about the way the New York Times, uh, CNN is told what they can and can't say about Israel. It's really stunning to see it from inter leaked internal memos. Uh, so, and that's at youtube.com slash the Katie Helper Show. Yeah, you've done great work covering this uh, this event, uh, Katie, over the last couple of months, and also your colleague Aaron Maté uh, at the Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal, have done a tremendous job. Oh yeah, and they've been smeared for debunking the uh, October seventh sexual violence story because no one wants to be called a rape denier, or a rape apologist, but all they're saying is Israel, which lies constantly, should show evidence. Yeah, and the is, UN this, is not ignoring it. The UN has tried to investigate, and Israel won't cooperate with the UN. I wonder why. And you can't get investigators on the ground in Gaza either to take witness testimonies because that's not happening. Uh, just another unfortunate uh, byproduct of the situation. But uh, Katie Halper, thank you very much for thank your so thoughts much. today. Really appreciate your contribution. Uh, and also a big thank you to Rachel Blevins, uh, who had to leave early for another interview. But uh, Rachel, fantastic independent journalist. And also David Clues from the Unity News Network holding up the standard uh, in the United Kingdom 
there in the independent media sphere. All of our panel members doing great work, and it's really important as well that we recognize uh, a lot of these independent media people because they're the ones who are on the front lines uh, every day. And I know a lot of them will think that, uh, or say, this is just another day at work, this is what I do, this is what I've always done. Uh, but at some point as well, we all need to as well acknowledge and respect uh, their contributions and their tenacity in chasing down some of these big stories in a way that uh, the mainstream media doesn't do and doesn't do consistently and thoroughly. And if not for independent media, alternative media, doing the work that mainstream media should be doing, uh, we'd probably be, have you know, completely different narratives uh, for a lot of these major stories surrounding war, uh, but also different policies from our government, because our policies that our government adopt are based on the information which our elected officials have, and they're based on the general consensus about a narrative around any given situation, crisis point, or war, or conflict. And if what's circulating around that conflict, around that war zone, are complete lies and fabrications, that is what's going to inform policy. I think we saw that in the immediate aftermath of the uh, October 7th event. A lot of lies were put out into the uh, information space, those informed policy, and that policy just stuck into place permanently, even after the initial lies were debunked. This is a great lesson in propaganda and policy, one for the history books. The question is, are our leaders, are people in mainstream media positions, editors, are they taking note of this right now? The same can be said with Ukraine. The same can be said with Syria. The same could be said with Libya. The same could be said, of course, with Iraq, and so on and so forth. On and on it goes. We have to solve these problems that are uh, inflicting our societies and the international system. And I think we're making big strides. We have seen tremendous things happen uh, in the last three and four months uh, as a result of this terrible tragedy. The one silver lining is there is a higher level of political awareness uh, more than ever uh, before. So there's something to uh, consider and something to be positive about. Uh, our co-host, uh, George Galloway, will be back for the next No to NATO meeting. He's currently on the campaign trail uh, in Rochdale uh, trying to uh, go into Parliament. Uh, that's going to be a tight contest. Everyone's wishing him uh, all the best and the best of luck uh, to get a result there. Certainly there's another good voice uh, to have in the House of Commons desperately needed. We hope there'll be more as well. We hope to have a change in the conversation, not just in the UK, uh, but internationally as well. I'm Patrick Henningsen. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, hosting, guest hosting this public meeting for No to NATO, No to War. Uh, wherever you are in the world, we appreciate your viewership on all of our different streaming platforms. And do share this program and share other episodes. They're highly informative. We have assembled great panels for this series, and we're going to keep doing it going forward. Thank you very much for tuning in. Take care, everybody. All the best. <laughs>